What's going on YouTube? This is Kyle from Hospitality MD coming back at you with another episode of our podcast interview series presented right here on YouTube. You can also listen in wherever you get your podcasts. Before we get started, you know the drill. Go down below, press subscribe, turn on notifications, give this video a thumbs up, and be ready to share it with your hospitality friends who you think will enjoy it. Today's episode is with the Joe Rogan of Hospitality. That's right, Will Slickers, host of Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast, along with Good Morning Hospitality, is here on Hospitality MD, and we're talking about how he got bit by the hospitality bug in the first place, and also what it's like to be a young person in the hotel and hospitality industry. Will Slickers has accomplished so much at the young age of 26 years old, and he is just getting started in his career in hotels. He was even younger. So we're talking about all that and more right here on Hospitality MD. This is a do not miss episode. So stay tuned and enjoy. Thanks for being on Hospitality MD, my friend. Really appreciate you uh, being on. Of course. Thanks for having me. It's, I think, been in the making for quite a while without us both knowing it until recently. But <laughs> yeah, it's great to be here. And thanks for having me. The uh, the power of Clubhouse really is what did it. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess as, as weird as that was, I mean, you were my the really the first person I spoke to on Clubhouse, actually, that first day I was on there. And uh, you showed me some hospitality, kind of got me acclimated, learned how it works. And, uh, and yeah, and since then, it's been great just talking to you, getting to know you, hearing your passion for the industry. Um, you, you really give a shit, don't you? You really like this industry. <laughs> uh, dude, it's, I, you remind me a lot of myself, like I'm only two years older or three years now, but um, just the, I remember being that young hotel manager and just I fell in love. I, I fell in love with people. I fell in love with hotels. I fell in love with revenue management and marketing and moments and memories and experience. Like, it, yeah, it, it gets me geek. Like I get really geeky about it. So um, yeah, dude, I, I love this industry. Um, I'm excited to have like connected with you on the clubhouse because I've definitely been seeing your name. Like, you know, we, we do probably, you probably do the same thing SEO search on the podcast to make sure, you know, you're, you're getting as exposed as you can for all your guests and, uh, you know, to continue to grow the show. And uh, I've been seeing your name so much in the hospitality MD and I'm like, all right, these guys are on my list. Like I want to collab with them. So uh, getting to know you through clubhouse was just a great way to finally make that happen. Yeah. Without a doubt, man. And, and, you know, I think obviously at this point, like we've, connected really not so much at least in my opinion through the podcasting element but through that yeah. raw love for the industry that you and I both share um so you know with that I kind of want to take it back and and ask you the first moment that you felt hospitality that you can remember you know there's actually a um one of my favorite books um second mountain by david brooks he talks mm -hmm. about the enunciation moment that everybody has in their life typically happens in childhood where you don't really know it, but that is kind of like the seed that plants your purpose in your life. Um, and I think it's clear that your purpose has been found. Do you know your enunciation moment? See, I don't know the exact moment. Uh, I've always been embedded in big groups and social settings. Like I've, I'm, I'm the seventh child of seven. Um, so having that, and I have a twin brother with special needs, uh, he has down syndrome, so he's very outgoing. Um, and there's just, there's no escaping that I was supposed to be, I had a love for people, um, from all different walks of life. Um, I can't remember the exact moment. I just remember as a kid for maybe the industry, um, every summer when I was really little, we would go to Seaside, Oregon, where I actually ended up becoming a manager of a 70 unit condominium hotel um 
we went there as a kid and I remembered we, it wasn't like a, we never stayed at glorious hotels. Like it was kind of a, just, Hey, we're here for the weekend to enjoy the beach and get some uh, saltwater taffies and, and go on the, you know, carousel rides and stuff like that. Um, but I, I always loved the, the, just the experience of being able to not be at home. Not that it was a bad place. It was just, it was something new. It was discovery. Um, it was those, you no, know, those senses that were heightened, uh, you know, being in a new place and kind of, being checked out and just being your own little world and especially as a kid uh, i think going to the beach was just part of the best you know uh best part of summers and and so i think that was the initial start and then i can tell you like the moment when i was working at a hotel my first hotel ever uh, that's when i knew i that's i was never going back there's no not doing it yeah, man. I actually, um, I got chills when you had mentioned um, just, you just enjoyed not being at home. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is kind of just one of those sentiments that it just like gives me the utmost faith for just tourism travel just forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, because, you know, it, it, it just depends like when you, when it comes to hotel specifically like your traditional brick and mortar hotels it's like mm -hmm. you you just you love it because you go and like your linens are just fresh and clean and everything looks great when you walk into the room and you know you go down for breakfast and whether it's a you know a hampton inn and you're eating like a biscuits and gravy from the buffet <laughs> or you're going to like a nicer place and having something a la carte you know it's I always talk about my dad who I've never seen him eat breakfast at home. It literally never witnessed him eat breakfast. But when we go and we're at a hotel and we're staying as a family, he'll be popping out of bed. First one, ready to go first one. Eat breakfast. Um, you know, and then even, I think it was like a meme or something I saw where it's like dads on vacation are like the most judgmental people when they wake up first and everybody's <laughs> still trying to sleep. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but the, the breakfast, right? Like you never see this, this man do something. It's like, yeah, travel and tourism, it makes you do something that you don't um, typically do. Your habits change. You get out of your mm -hmm. routine a little bit. So that's, that's, that's really nice. Now, just to kind of dive in a little deeper with you on that, like what types of places, like where were you staying when you would go and travel? Cause I kind of start to maybe get the sentiment that like, you know, this vacation rental stuff maybe was mm -hmm. even enunciated back then a little bit. Cause if you weren't really staying in like hotels like that, what was, what was that like? What, what were your accommodations? Um, as a kid, like when we went to Seaside, it was this little inn. It was called the Starry Night Inn. Um, I remember because it's still there and they rebranded and they, they've kind of gone under new ownership. And um, so it was it was a little inn. It's like very small, nothing like your, your you know, Holiday Inn or Marriott Hotel where you, it's very um, or like it's not like a courtyard, you know, it's very, very intimate. Um, and so but I never really traveled much after that. Like I did some sporting events. And like, whenever we got to stay at a hotel, I was so excited because it was just like, you know, that, like you said, that feeling of the new sheets, the, the clean bathroom and just like the, the breakfast, if you got it. And just, it, it was a cool, it was something different. It was something new. Um, but I would say when I joined the military, that's when I started getting to travel a little bit more. Like I never traveled much throughout high school or middle school or anything like that. And then um, joined the national guard. So I got to you know, get out of my home state a little bit and travel and do some whatever, you know, whatever we're called to, to do. Um, and then I would say the most I've traveled and in, in the vacation rental space really got introduced to myself when my parents had this extra two bedroom apartment above their garage. So they're like, well, you're too young to rent it out. I was like 16. And so they're <laughs> like, you're not, you're not going to live there. Um, what, what, what are we going to do with this, this asset? And um, they start putting on Airbnb well, no, this was actually a little bit later in life. But anyways, uh, I was like 18, 19. And um, that's when I started working at a hotel. So that's kind of how that vacation rental model got introduced to me. And um, yeah, to, to answer your question, I, I never really traveled as much until recent years where like as an adult, that's where I finally got to embed my myself into the, the place that I love, which is hotels. So, okay. So as you were starting to kind of see like, cause your parents had this place above the garage, people would come in on Airbnb and stay there. So you were seeing yeah. the people come in while simultaneously for the first time being exposed to what it's like to actually work at a hotel. 
Yeah. Were you kind of just like, oh, like I know service now. Like I know like how to make a bed. Like I can start kind of getting involved in this now. Did it, did it turn yeah. into that? Were you starting to see those parallels and connect the dots a little bit? A little bit. I started working for an autograph collection with Marriott. So that that was like the first introduction. I had a failed uh, chauffeur and event company um, the year before. That's my first like exposure to entrepreneurism, entrepreneurism, sorry. And um, I, obviously I was competing against Uber. So that was, uh, it was like the year I, op- the day I opened it, I closed it the same day a year later. Uh, it was just too much overhead. There was a lot of learnings I had to go through, but I remember picking up these guests from this autograph collection. It was a very nice hotel, brand new built, um, just had a little bit of a Bellagio feel, but also some nice luxury, just presence. I don't know. It was just a great, really good ambiance. And I remember picking up guests there and I was like, after I closed my, my business, I was like, where am I going to work? What am I going to do for money? Like, how am I going to pay bills? And I went and applied because I remember picking them up and they just had that clean look, that suit and tie feel, the slick back hair, the the lobby was popping full. This was obviously pre-COVID. Uh, the lobby was popping with people with drinks and dresses and conventions going down the hall. And it was just like, yeah, I want that. Like, it was, it was awesome. And so I remember working there and I learned the brand standards of Marriott and what the autograph and uh, collection was and how these umbrella brands were were kind of set up and structured and then creating you know that brand standard that Marriott has and how to provide ex- exceptional service what does a check-in process look like how do you do it efficiently and effectively that the guest doesn't feel burdened and 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 annoyed with all the extra steps and what can you do behind the scenes what versus what can you do on on the stage or on show um, so learning all these things and then seeing my parents basically be gms or owners of their own little hotel i was like easy let's just apply this to that and uh we started doing things like creating um automated messages so for frequently asked questions and having you know the the little welcome guidebook at at the check-in so when they got their door code uh, instead of seeing a front desk um, they just had all the house rules, the instructions, the how to get here. Here's a couple of local discounts for the coffee roaster or whatever to really make it feel like a hotel. And um, so that was kind of like the, the transition. It was like, okay, I know how to do this here on property. How can I do this for just doing it remotely? So those are your contributions. Like you came to your parents and you're like, I'm learning stuff. Like, yeah. let's try and do this together. Like I can help you because, you know, like. I'm a hotelier now. Like this yeah, is what yeah, I do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that exactly. Is, that is beautiful, my friend. Um, so you started out at front desk then at this autograph. Oh, hundred percent. I I remember the day I interviewed. Uh, I'm still friends with my old manager, Eric Peluso. Uh, never forget the interview. I asked for a job. I gave him my resume, uh, which was not very good resume. I had no hotel experience, especially for this four star type property. Um, and he interviewed me and goes. Uh, this I'll never forget this, and I think you'll you'll like this as a hotel your, yourself. Um, he goes, okay, how how are you with people? I said I love people, I, I'm great with people. And he was like, how are you with like systems and like tech, like check in software? And I was like, I've never done it before. I'm so I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to be really rusty, but I'm willing to learn. Um, and he says, you just said what I needed you to say. He said I can't teach you people skills. So you would not have gotten hired, but I can teach you the rest. So if you're willing to learn and experience this, then you're hired. And I said, let's do it. And it, we never looked back. I was there for a good two and a half years almost. And then um, and and just did as much as I could at the front desk, became supervisor, um, became assistant, and then helped with other departments as well and just kind of figured out the ins and out. And so, yeah, it was a, it was a great time. Yeah. And autograph collections are cool. Um, this was, I, I don't know if I heard you say it somewhere else. Maybe it was on clubhouse. This was like 700 plus rooms, right? So you got to oh, yeah. like dive into like big box hotel operations. Uh, yeah. you know, obviously you're talking about probably a good amount of square footage for event space and just the whole yeah. shebang food and beverage outlets, everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We had, um, so 716 rooms, presidential suite, governor's suite, penthouses, junior suites. Um, and then we had the 60,000 square foot event space of convention space. And we were connected. We had actually a, a bridge right to the convention center across the, the way. So it was a very, right, where is this? Where is this at? Spokane, Washington. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Nice. And, um, and we had a terrace bar, a whiskey lounge, a regular lobby bar, 
uh, a tapas restaurant, a Starbucks. Like, yeah, I, I could, I still know that place like the back of my hand. Like it's, I was, I lived and breathed in that property and uh, yeah, it was beautiful. It was amazing. Yeah. It's there's just something so, so special about like those, just those kind of hotels where everybody just gathers to create memories. Like it's just, mm-hmm. So nice. So, so yeah. nice. And yeah. so you did that. And at what point did you say, well, I think I kind of had my time here. Like, you know, what did that kind of look yeah. like that transition process? It was hard. It was really hard. Um, Cause I, I think I debated with myself for six months if I was going to do it. Um, long story short, uh, it's a very fast paced property. And I still love those people today. Like this is a great property. I would, if they were like, Hey, we want you to come run this thing. I probably go back. Uh, even though I've been nice. an entrepreneur and, and solo for uh, almost a little over a year now, I, I probably would just, just to feel that, that first, um, that first like moment I had there. Um, but long story short for six months, I was kind of debating it's a very fast paced hotel. And with, with that, the mentorship aspect wasn't there. I wasn't able to take 30 minutes or an hour in the back office with the director of rooms and, and revenue in order to figure out ADR, RevPAR, occupancy, how to calculate these things, how are decisions made when it comes to making profit or um, to doing all these back end operations, especially with distribution channels, like being on Expedia and booking and there's all the back end stuff that we deal with, especially at that scale. Um, and I was hungry for that. Like I was hungry. Like I was, I was, listening to podcasts like fuel hotel marketing podcast was like my daily go-to um, and just like trying to get uh, embedded. And so not having that mentorship um, when I finally was sell- like made that decision to talk to them, like, Hey, I really want to advance. Like I want to become a manager or I want to do something. I, I-, I want to step up. And uh, they're like, well, you're already, you know, leading the front desk team, you know, you're in charge of all that. So just, just stay there and we'll, we'll figure something out. And I was like, okay, I wait a little bit longer. And I was like, look guys, I really like our guest service scores are high. My turnover rate for my, our, our team is low. Um, we're, we're successful in a lot of areas. Obviously we're not perfect, but like we're, we're thriving and I, I want to do more. I want to learn. And it just didn't have the opportunity. So granted, it was a very hard decision. Um, I applied for a couple of different positions on the Oregon coast because that's where I remember growing up as a kid, I was like, all right, maybe it would be nice to go where the memories are and, and see if I can make a, make a cool property or, you know, career from, from that. And um, so got hired as a uh, front office supervisor and sales coordinator for a nice independent boutique. Uh, They had free, um, not free, but they had staff uh, housing. So I could use for a couple months until I found like an apartment and yeah, they, they just made the transition very easily. Um, and they let me come stay out for a weekend and interview and meet the team and meet the people and got to talk to the owner and ve- it just felt very w- hospitable and welcoming. Um, so I made the decision to move and, and go from there. So that was that 70 unit condominium. Is that what the same property? No, or- actually not. Yeah, okay. it was not. So, um, uh, I'm still very close friends with the owner of that property, but um, basically they're going through some ownership and some management transitions. So um, I made that, that, uh, that decision to uh, then move over to the 70 unit one, which was just a city. It was like a block away from where I lived and um, it was very nice. I could wear a suit and tie. Um, the one thing I had to trouble transitioning from was going from suit and tie four star autograph to independent beach uh, property, which it was still a very fa- like nice family resort, but it was very casual, um, not suit and tie, no button up. Like I just, yeah, it was hard for me to transition to that. So when I got to that 70 unit uh, condominium, uh, I finally like put my, my anchor and roots in and, and stayed there for a good long time for, for that property. Yeah, man. Um, I actually, I, I, I relate a little bit to what you were saying, you know, if you could go back and they said, why don't you go ahead and run this, this autograph collection, like that, you know, you said you'd probably do it despite what you're doing now, which is Mm -hmm. because I crave that so much, like on a daily basis, I'm like, I love what I'm doing with the podcast. I love, you know, uh, you know what I'm doing with hospitality MD, don't get me wrong. Um, but I was also doing it before when I was in a hotel every day as well. Yeah. And it's just, I, I miss it. I miss yeah. being in that environment, 
day in and day out. Um, I feel, I the, feel like pain, man. I feel the it's first heartbreaking really is. No. Yeah, exactly. I was gonna say the first time somebody actually asked me that was on an interview for my show. Like somebody I was telling them about the hotel experience cause they were uh, a company that was providing service and tech for uh, hotels and vacation rentals. And I was talking to him about my hotel experience. He's like, do you miss it? And I, like, while we're recording, and I was like, no one's ever asked me that. Um, and then I was like, yeah. actually, I, I do. Like, there's days where I definitely miss the in and out of the day-to-day operations. And just, there's just something you can't, there's no way to describe it. And I think like people like you, people like me, other people that are listening that really know that feeling. You're like, there is no way to describe like it, it could bring a tear to my face if I, I had that moment. Like I probably, if I got that call like tomorrow, I'd probably cry. Like it's, it's something yeah. special about it. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're giving me chills here. Um, well, cause I, I really, it's, it's un it's, uh, unreplicatable on un- whatever the, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you can't re- replicate the feeling of being in a hotel of being with the team being in such a diverse group of people on a daily basis, um, yeah. uh, overcoming those challenges of running day-to-day operations of a place with so many moving parts. And then just being with the guests and just talking to people and just being just kind of boom, boom, boom in that environment. Um, so one thing I just thought of, um, do you think that your love of being on a team in a hotel, uh, goes with your military experience as well because i kind of feel like maybe there's a some parallels that can be connected there what do you think about yeah. that no that's for that's such a really good point and um to be honest i was on a other podcast that was more entrepreneurism slash like self-motivation slash self-help because i went through a lot of depression i had a i was very um i had a lot you know i didn't have the easiest childhood but i also didn't have a horrible childhood and and so i was on this other podcast um talking about like overcoming challenges and and like things like depression and, and whatnot. And I, you know, in high school, I had never had like that one group of friends where I was like, these are my people. It was, I was with the jocks this one minute and then I'm with the the class clowns the other, then I'm with the prep kids and I'm with the kids that maybe not a lot of people hang out with. Like I was just everywhere. I floated so much. I just didn't have, I never had that like sense of belonging. And then when I joined the military, um, it was the first thing I actually committed to like, being in that position where you don't have like your set core people commitment to whether it was a job or just overall like relationships and other things. It was very, I I, I don't even know how to describe it, but the first thing I've told myself I was going to do and I committed to it and I went, saw it all the way through, signed a six year contract, went through basic training. I went through AIT. I went through all the stuff and it was one of the hardest things I ever did, but it was also one of the best things I did because I found myself, um, I found confidence. I became the person that I am. Like I got attention to detail, um, communication skills, and then also just, it was very ground. It was a really grounding um, experience. And so with that, um, I think that is what helped play a role into my love for hospitality and not, it kind of solidified. I love people. I love the camaraderie. I love the, the teamwork, you know, when you're going through, when you're with a bunch of people you'd never met before and you're getting yelled at and destroyed by a bunch of drill sergeants and you guys are getting through the tough tasks like together, whether it's in the field or, and just getting destroyed in the barracks. Uh, yeah, it was, there's just something about it. And so I think that definitely played a role, especially with, um, just the hotel team, you know, I think you can probably relate like your hotel, like coworkers and friends, like you guys learn each other on a deep level, especially like when it's a dead time at the front desk or whatever, like you just start talking and all of a sudden, you just know this whole person's life story in a night. So like it, it gets pretty intense and intimate. So I think that definitely for sure played a role. It's, it's raw when you get to know your coworkers. <laughs> like, and it's, it's funny, you know, you're like, yeah, we're just with these people we have never really met and we're getting yelled at by the drill sergeants or you hop on the front desk kind of sold out night, you may as well be doing the same thing. You know what yeah, I mean? Like it's exactly. It's, and cause I've, I've, I've seen, you know, I've noticed that a lot of, um, you know, former military, uh, like I had a good, one of the first people I worked with, um, was, I think in the army reserves is what it, what it actually was. And mm-hmm. he loved hotels for the same exact reason. Um, and you, you kind of see that a lot because of that camaraderie and the teamwork and the shared goals and the shared mission. Yeah. Um, 
and then you know you you talk about you were there but they weren't teaching you right and then Mm -hmm. i'm thinking about it now and it's like this is also coming from somebody who already was an entrepreneur before so you still have that kind of fire in your belly where you're like Mm -hmm. you know like i want to learn about this business or how you know this this type of thing was that playing a role in in that for sure was it kind of difficult for you to kind of be like a a worker bee for a little while after running your own company yeah it was it definitely played a role like i was okay with being the worker bee but I definitely, I think we've talked about this on Clubhouse and a few other things. Like I was so hungry to learn at at such a fast pace. Not that I wasn't willing to slow down and learn and really just get really good at what I was learning, but um, I wanted to try new things. I was like, I was a unexperienced hotelier in the sense of like, I saw the world differently. I'm like, why, why is this system set up like this when we can do it this way? Like I, I, I like to figure out the whys and can it be improved or if I find out the why I'm like, okay, that makes sense. I mean, I definitely should not mess with that system because it is created for the purpose of what it does and that type of stuff. Um, so it definitely played a huge role and that's kind of what got me into starting the podcast. Um, when I moved to the Oregon coast, I had no friends or family, uh, at, in that city, I was in maybe a five hour drive from the nearest family member and, and friend. So, um, that's where I was like, okay, well, I have this fire. I have this creative itch that I have to scratch. And um, I'm pretty sure you know who these people are, but Gary Vee and and Tony Robbins. um, Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, Yeah. They, uh, I saw an episode on YouTube. Uh, They were both together talking about certain things and business and blah, blah, blah. And then podcasting came up and they're like, go to anchor.fm. It's free. Get a $20 mic off Amazon and just start creating something. And I was like, okay, well, I love, I love hotels and hospitality. So I'm going to create a podcast. And so that's what created that and then turn it to obviously what it is today. So that's uh that's really funny. Same story here for hospitality and <laughs> with you know, uh, Greg and I were kind of listening to Gary V and stuff. It, it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't like one video, like it wasn't like a breakthrough moment like that, but it was kind of like over time, it was like, there's no excuse anymore. Like time to yep. just start doing it. Um, we're not going to let anybody judge us. Right. We're just going to go in and, and <laughs> yeah, do it. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's true. Like you really have to kind of overcome that, but I will say, you know, and, and I'm sure maybe you feel the same way. Like you're over there five hours away from friends and family, the hospitality industry can al- already be a very isolated uh, to isolate yourself from people because it's like your normal, normal friends, right. There are, Hey, we're going out, we're doing this. We're going to be doing this. Yeah. Uh, or, Hey, when you get off work, I don't know when I'm getting off work. Like I can't make any plans. And then yeah. like, you know, when I'm, when you're off, it's just kind of like time to just vegetate and recharge because I'm just <laughs> like, an amoeba. Yeah. like I'm a single celled organism. You can't expect <laughs> me to do anything. Like this is shit that people in our industry kind of face on a daily basis. It can be lonely. It can be isolating at times. Uh, but the rewarding aspect of it, I think definitely makes it all worth it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the podcast is a way to connect with people. Um, I remember uh, this was especially like I was working at a property that um, you just made me feel terrible on a daily basis. It was just like I was losing every single day. Um, and I just disagreed with everything they were doing with managing it. And I you know, felt like I was kind of stuck in a cycle. But then mm-hmm. I got to go on you know, and interview Christine Trippy or somebody else who was like, I, who made me feel like, oh, there are people out there who just get it. They know what to do and they know what the right thing is. Uh, and then it motivates you and it makes you feel like you're not uh, alone. Because yeah. even within a hotel, my experience has been that I'm frustrated with the way that it's being managed um, or being uh, kind of run because it seems like hospitality sometimes takes a back seat uh, and people confuse what doesn't matter with what really does matter. Okay. So you relate to that. You've seen Oh, a hundred percent, dude. A hundred percent. Yeah. Like so you, you have those owners or maybe a GM or a director of ops who they're all about PL. and I get it. Like P and L's are important. We have to keep our, our team employed and our business open. But if you let the moment you let hospitality take the back seat, I think that's when you lose. That's yeah. when you lose. Yeah. And, and so, it's, uh, it's, it's, sad because um it's like people's lives are being ruined by management companies all the time all the time 
it's like they don't even understand the like the the depth and the breadth of damage that they're doing to real people whether it's guests or or but primarily the uh the teams who work for them and i think that's why now like you know and i hate to bring up covid because like we've been talking about it right but yeah uh, but it's it's relevant you know this is the worst crisis on record for this industry so i guess it'll come up once or twice but you know now you have during covid their hotels maybe they're reopening or they're you know climbing back up a little bit they want to bring people back and people have been sitting at home for seven eight nine ten months and they're like wait a second i was Mm -hmm. getting used and abused i was treated like shit um you know, I was getting stepped all over. No, I'm good. I'm just gonna, mm-hmm. I'm just gonna stay home. I don't need nobody to listened to me when I wanted to talk about an idea or an issue or like, yeah, or even just ask a question on why we do this or what this actually means. Like, why is this important? What is like, when I found out that rev bar is more important than ADR, I was like, why did nobody tell me that? Why are we right, pushing like ADR? These, yeah. Right, these huge, the, the huge thing. And we're, we're talking about yeah, we, I mean, because that's like, that's the, it's like the unsophisticated thing, like rate, of course, like rate matters, but they just teach you that rate is like an isolated, uh, you know, kind of thing, but it's more nuanced than that. It, mm-hmm. it really is. And, um, but of course they, they don't teach you that because especially, and I think this is where, you know, your, your larger box properties, like, I mean, cause you started out at your exposure here to the hotels was probably very specialized. You're a front desk agent. So you mm-hmm. stand here and you check in 400 people and you shut up and you do it and you want to get trained. Well, don't worry. You can, you can wait for that because we really do care about you, but when it actually comes to doing it, you just, it's just, it's just not going to happen. Um, yeah. I remember when I like went like maybe five feet out from the front desk at that property and my managers obviously saw it like on a camera and they're like on our radio, they're like, Will, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm literally just helping a guest, like doing my job. And they're like, okay, okay. We just, they, they weren't used to seeing people leave the front desk, like especially five feet. And I was like, okay, we got to change this. So I got that have it uh broken really quick uh well you know uh god forbid some of those uh some of those guys had to come out and help with the line or something i mean you know what i mean it's like you know it's kind of i you know sometimes these some of these uh mid-level managers who have been promoted for the wrong reasons are sitting in the back office watching the cameras and then you step away from the front desk and, you know, their heart starts going, oh, shit, I might have to actually step out of the desk here pretty soon. Like, it's just all wrong, man, in, yeah, in a lot of exactly. ways. <laughs> exactly. Certainly. Exactly. It, it was it was different. And, like, when, when I took over the management role at that condominium hotel, um, I, I wanted to approach things differently because I remember, like, and my desk, it was weird because, like, the, my desk was in the lobby. We had the front desk and then you had – manager so like i was sitting right there at the condominium hotel Mm -hmm. okay yeah yeah and so sorry to jump from one hotel to the other but no no that's uh, good yeah yeah and i just like i remember it was just it was a different type of feeling because i remember when i was working the front desk and my manager was watching like it was just kind of weird and it was like all this but then when i took over i wanted to i wanted to shift that i wanted to get them I was behind the front desk a lot. I was in housekeeping a lot. I was inspecting rooms. I was helping clean. Like I was trying to be as active as possible. And then I would set aside later that hours of whatever, you know, that mid-level uh, manager would be doing while they're watching the cameras, you know, trying to get their their reports done or whatever. Like that would be my my off time at later, like during uh, audit or early in the morning or whatever. And so I think if you shift it a little bit too, it's, it's quite interesting to see how that will, like me, taking that time to get away from the computer and not watch the the staff and just be a part of the staff. It was completely different. So I think uh, the approach that mid-level managers have versus like the independent boutique ones that can, can probably do, excuse me, do a lot more is it's quite interesting to think about. You know, it's funny because it's like, we talk about as if it's some groundbreaking concept, like, you know, instead of just watching your staff on the cameras, when you like, cause you're not being productive there during that time anyway, if you're just watching them on the camera. So why not just be a part of them? And then you'll really know what they're doing. Like you want to know what 100%. they're doing by watching the cameras, just get out there and do it and be a part of it. And then, you know, obviously um, 
you have to find time to do your work. And, and I think this is actually because it's such a balance, right? Like, you know, one of the problems that, that, you know, I, I've had before would, would be like, you know, I'm getting there in the morning, you know, as a manager, and then you kind of spend the day with your AM crew and then PM comes in and you're like, well, I can't just like isolate myself now because PM has got to get some love. And then all of a sudden it's yeah. like, all right, well, it's like six or seven o'clock. Oh, everybody's going on break now. Oh, okay. Now I'm going to come. Oh, got it. Okay. So now it's mm-hmm. like seven, eight, nine o'clock. So it's, it's, and you know, obviously we have to look out for, you know, you can't uh, give somebody anything from an empty glass. Uh, and I think it's, it's tough, especially like when you're young and you're hungry and you want to be a good leader, you want to be a good hotelier. Um, it's tough. It's, it's, it's just a huge balance. Yeah. Uh, had, what would you say some of your biggest challenges were in kind of navigating hotel management kind of coming up? Uh, I would just say, like you said, I think keyword was balance for sure, because um, I had, a, you know, the, the manager before me, you know, there was, it was a weird transition period. Plus like I was uh, long story short, my experience was a little bit different because like right when I got the management position and we announced it to the whole staff and the teams and, the company because they had another hotel down the road and and so it was weird because like okay he's the new manager he's gonna be running all this stuff he's gonna be you know overseeing housekeeping maintenance and front desk and da, 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 da. but then i two weeks later i had to leave for my two weeks training for the national guard so i was like taking over and trying to learn everything and like what my roles were and then like how all my like new permissions and updates on the, the back end of uh travel click and all those other things right um learning all of it and then just gone and so they're like, oh, we had him, he's gone. And then I came back and a lot happens in two weeks. Uh, I, I brought on some new staff members and I didn't get to properly train them myself or even be involved in the training part. So like just coming back and it was, it was crazy. So pretty much it was putting out fires every five seconds. But I think the biggest thing was trying to find that balance of empowerment for my team. So making sure that I wasn't being not bugged or bothered, but being, hey, what do I do with this? What do I do with that? How do I help this guest? So like giving them like, Hey, you know, like you've already answered your own question. Just ask me the question. Um, so finding ways like um, to, to really balance that out and not take over and feel like I have to do everything, um, not be a hand holder, but really be like, all right, go on. You're good. Like go out, get, go talk to the guests, go answer the phone. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and so like that, and then, understand the biggest thing I actually learned when I was the manager. Uh, I learned this from a podcast guest, but I learned that sometimes you, because you hire somebody for a role doesn't mean they're a good fit for that role. And you can see that they show a lot of signs and I hired someone for front or for uh, housekeeping. And she was not made for housekeeping, not because she couldn't do the work, but she loved people. She loved service. She Mm -hmm. loved to like, you could tell this girl one thing and she would have gotten 10 facts out of you and learned about you and like actually been intentional with the conversation and recommended the best, you know, clam chowder in the town and where her and her husband go. And like, she would, she was just naturally gifted at that. And was like, yeah, you're like, not that her work at housekeeping wasn't good and that she wasn't keeping up. She was, but she wasn't happy. Like she wants, she wants that experience. So finding that like, okay, do we have a position? Can we expose her to the front desk? Can we get her more involved with the guests and maybe even just have her at the manager's reception and like serving the beer and wine and just being part of that like conversation and find, I think that was the biggest thing I learned finding how are, are people one good at where they're at? Are they happy where they're at? And are they going to thrive where they're at? Cause all those three things will tell you how your team's going to work and how successful the hotel will be, or even just uh, any kind of property or company. Um, so that was like the biggest learning thing for me. Right. Even, yeah, even on like the largest levels, like putting the right people in the right places, not only for the organization, but for them, because that's ultimately mm-hmm. what it, what it comes down to now. Cause so you do the podcast, but you also have a vacation rental company as well. Right. So, yeah. So I started, uh, started one, um, early 2000 or late 2019. I left that, uh, sold my shares, uh, just for lots of different reasons, but it was a mutual thing for everybody. And now I've started another one with a mutual friend of ours, which, you know, and had uh, gotten to talk to Adam Knight. So. Oh, very good. I didn't realize that um, that was actually a joint venture between the two of you. So, oh, yeah. so you're basically kind of doing, um, cause I think 
again, like I was telling you off the record and myself, I think the hospitality MD audience being primarily like brick and mortar hotel people, mm-hmm. maybe a little ignorant to, uh, to the vacation rental game. And I'm sorry, audience, that is my fault for not exposing you guys. But um, why don't you just tell us a little bit about like what yeah. that looks like, why it's important differences similarities like give us a little clinic here on what that what vacation rental stuff is no for sure and you don't know what you don't know right so don't don't feel bad for not like it's some it's something that i think it's still a very big growing segment of hospitality uh, but it's also a very new segment so there's a it's new things every day that we're all learning so don't don't sweat it um so long story short short-term rentals think about it like they've been around for you know a long time. VRBO is, uh, well, well now Verbo is tw- over 20 years old. So vacation rental or home rental is not new. Um, but Airbnb really faced it and, and innovated to a point of the barrier level of entry uh, to be a really low level. Like I can go to anybody and say, hey, you have the second vacation home. Let me rent it out for you on Airbnb or other platforms. Um, but for hoteliers, the easiest way for me to explain it is just think of your, let's say the 70 unit condominium hotel. And let's think about it as a one unit property. So occupancy, when it's booked, it's 100% occupancy versus when you have a room level where it's 30% occupancy out of that 30 rooms or whatever. Um, so just think about it as like you're a GM of a small hotel. You just do the same things. You create a beautiful listing. You have beautiful pictures. You try to capture the guests to say, I'm wanting to stay there. I see myself there already. And then of course, adding amenities. And the biggest thing that I'm preaching through this time of COVID specifically is focusing on the community. If you have a cool neighborhood or a cool uh, city that has great companies that you love to go to for drinks or coffee or restaurants or activities, hiking, whatever, show it off. You are becoming a destination heir, as I like to call them. You're creating a destination with this property. So really that's the simplest thing. And just understanding that, um, you know, it's more hands off. You're like not on property. So a lot of companies do um, have face-to-face check-in where they give the guests their guidebook or just welcome them, in, welcome them in by opening the door and just grabbing their luggage. Like there are people that do that, um, but really you can automate some of this stuff. You get a little uh, remote door code, you give them a new code, they get punched in that code and they are checked in. Um, that's really it. And you'll love this, Kyle. The guests don't show up at 10 a.m. while housekeeping is still cleaning because they are mm. they uh, they abide by that 4 p.m. or 3 p.m. check-in time. Like when it's 3 p.m., they they show up or they show up a little bit later because they have a door code and you don't have to worry about somebody harassing your housekeeping team or your front desk saying, "Well, I just got it from the airport and what am I going to do with all my luggage and blah 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 blah." blah. <laughs> like, yeah, like so that's I'd be the, lying if I said I didn't miss that. I'll take that right <laughs> now any day any day. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, that's, that's, that's interesting. You know, it, it, like it's a, it's a one room hotel and you're kind of, mm-hmm. you know, you manage that just like you would. And I'm, I'm assuming that, um, you know, the, the revenue management component to it is huge and probably something that I would anticipate and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would assume that your like your mom and dad, for example, let's just take them as just essentially anybody who just has their spare bedroom listed on Airbnb, who doesn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they're probably leaving money on the table uh, in terms of their revenue management strategy. So is that something that uh, you're, what's the name of the company now that you and Adam started? Uh, Recreation rentals. Recreation rentals. So you guys would actually help with the revenue management side of it as well. So they can maximize their return. And then would it just be kind of a uh, revenue sharing model? Like, you know, we kind of, you're kind of just a pat, just like a, a third party management company for hotels. Yeah. They're the hotel owner. So they yeah. kick back and collect their check, but you know, like your, most of your third party management contracts uh, you know, they'll be like, here's three to 5% of revenue and you do it. Mm-hmm. And, or, you know, maybe you get a little bit more, but um, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. You described it perfectly. Like, so I always tell new people getting into the air. Like I hate calling it the Airbnb game because it's not Airbnb. They don't own your property. It's your property on Airbnb. You know, the, it's like people say, well, I booked through booking.com. It's like, well, we're not a booking.com hotel. We market on booking.com long story short. 
Um, I always tell people if you're getting in the short term rental game and you're putting your property on Airbnb, you have to be as professional as possible. So look at hotels for an example, Marriott, Hilton, IHG, Best Western, whatever. Clean sheets, good amenities, good service, affordable price. So you think about, you know, they do this very well for their their brand, for their asset, for whatever type of scale it is, whether it's a budget economy, uh, mid scale high upper scale luxury, whatever. Um, they do this very well and it's consistent. So I tell the same thing to either my clients or people that are just like, Hey, how do I get into short-term rentals? They can make it, make it a hotel, nice sheets, get all like clean the crap out of that bit, that, that, excuse me, I almost swore. Um, that bad no, boy. No, like, please, you've been hearing me swear, man. I think our <laughs> listeners are used to it by now. So whatever you okay. want. Okay. I was like, well, like clean the hell of that bitch and like make sure yeah. it's spotless and, and really just understand that you are offering something different than just a home. Like this is where people make memories. This is where people, when they're coming into town for a funeral, they're staying here, they're mourning here. Like you have to understand the, the story behind the guests. And then of course, um, the I guess the like you said it is based off a of revenue share model. There is so many different um, I guess property types. You can go for multifamily. You can go for shared room, which is like a room just out of a house that someone lives in, which I don't recommend as much. Um, even though some places they actually do pretty well. Um, and then there's the whole family rental or whole unit rental, which is a whole entire home that's not occupied by anybody. Uh, and it's a based off a of rev share model. So I don't get paid unless my you know, property gets booked. And if my owner gets paid, then I'm getting paid. And so, so yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to, I was going to say the only difference. And so hotels don't really charge a, a housekeeping uh, fee um, for Airbnbs or short-term rentals or anything like that. Most it's pretty standard actually for that type of traveler that there is a cleaning fee. So it could be very dependent. Like I remember a luxury property we managed, we had a $500 cleaning fee. Um, and cause it was huge, like 22, 22,000 square feet. Um, and then for like my parents' property, they do $75 cleaning fee. Um, very small, but it gets covers the cost basically. Um, and so as the management company, you take a percentage of the overall uh, gross revenue cleaning fees. So that way your team, because you have employees, whether they're contractors or actual W2 cleaners, um, you still have to capture that cleaning fee because you're you're the one buying the products. You're the one putting the team there. You have the softwares, the backend stuff, all that stuff. Um, you're really the, like you said, management company taking over for that owner. So, I mean, you know, I was sitting here thinking, ah, vacation. Like I was actually low key closed minded, but I was like, you know what? <laughs> all I know are like hotels. Like, you know, I, it, vacation rental. I don't know anything about all that new, the, all that new stuff. But it's the same damn thing, pretty much. It really is, yeah. uh, and yeah. sounds like fun. It could be like a good opportunity to scratch that that hotel itch, right? Like, because yeah. you know, like we kind of talked about, you know, it's hard to not be in there every day. And again, like I will always ride or die for brick and mortar hotels because when you pull up to an Airbnb, or not an Airbnb, but a vacation rental, yes. I'll get in the habit of saying, "There we go, Kyle." When we pull up to a vacation rental, we're not getting the same feeling that you got when you pulled up to pick up those guests for the first time in front of the autograph. It's yeah. just not the same. And not that it's not something that a consumer would want to have, because obviously, mm -hmm. uh, like you illustrated, it's becoming a growing segment uh, within the hospitality industry. Um, but that romance maybe is yeah. quite always there. Um, yeah. It's, and it's different. Like I stayed at a condominium property in Cancun and the, the host or the manager had a private shuttle service that picked me up from the airport. Like oh. they had like all, they had that romanticized, like you walked on property, they had the, it was part of like, there's a all-inclusive resort and then the condominium and they kind of had like a partnership. So there's different ways. Like it's not, it's very, uh, I would say there's not one experience that is the same. There's not one property that's the, the same. So you could get that very hands off where you just get your checking code and all that other stuff, or you could actually have that little romance where they pick you up, they take your luggage up, they open the door for you, they leave you all these little amenities and services and whatnot. Like it, it's it's pretty cool. Like it's and, and especially during COVID. And I, again, I hate bringing it up, but like COVID-19, we've seen this segment really grow because it's kind of isolated. You don't have all the shared lobby stuff or elevators and like that, I guess, part that makes people concerned about hotels during this time. But 
like you said, hotels are never going away. Vacation rentals are being very professionalized and, and get becoming a, a pretty cool standard uh, or professionalized uh, segment of hospitality. But for people like you and me, especially us younger people that are entrepreneurial at heart, this is actually probably my favorite discovery about the whole thing is that the entry level or the barrier of uh, entry to get into hotel ownership is very low, especially if you go through this way, you can use this to actually then buy or manage a hotel, a boutique hotel, and, and use the certain things and systems that you learn from short-term rentals so to and, hospita- and hotels as a new hotel hospitality brand. So I mean, you really could cool. do like a full circle kind of thing where, you know, you start out in hotels, you learn that, uh, apply that to the vacation rental space, and then complete the, the, the circle and use that elevated experience by actually being the CEO of your man, own management company, right? And then apply that to to a, getting a hotel at some point or securing yeah. a management contract. I mean, you really do bring up a great point. It's, um, and then especially like, ugh, shit I hate about the hotel industry. Just, oh, you, to be a GM of this brand, you have to be approved by the brand. To be a management company, you have to be approved by the brand. You, to do this, you gotta be yeah. approved by the brand. It's just- talk about red tape and just corporate bureaucracy and just everything that you don't want to deal with. I think it sounds like vacation rentals are a good kind of medium compromising point uh, between the scratching that itch, but then you don't have to deal with all the bullshit that comes along with it. hundred percent. You took the words right out of my mouth and that's why like, and it's cool because you get to create like your own brand and like, be actually more personable you like tell your story that's like the coolest part about vacation rentals is that people like guests that are staying with us like love reading our about page i don't know why but they love hearing just like why we got into the industry and and it gives them that connection because then when they're messaging you or you know at check-in if they have any issues they do feel like they can just feel more comfortable and it, it gives that cool experience and um, like you said, I, I can't wait to use this as a leverage to buy my own boutique hotel and start creating uh, an inventory and portfolio of myself and and continuing on the journey and, and the, the legacy, basically. And you'll do it um, because you're, you're, I mean, failure is not an option, right? It's, oh, no, 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 no. It's no. going to happen. Right. It's Just like happen. you, like you get it. I see the smile yeah. on your face as, yeah. as we're telling me, I'm like, you, you get it. Like the failure is not an option for people like yourself and, and, and me and a few others that we get to have on our podcast or whatever. You can tell there, there's no going back. Like even through this shit storm of a pandemic and just the way the world is, you can tell the people that are not we are not going back to anything else other than hospitality and that's that's in our blood that won't stop right and and that's actually i feel a a certain obligation and a certain responsibility to um because not everybody is this way and there's nothing wrong with that so i i do feel like if it's in your dna to want to make an impact or keep going and you really are married to hospitality and married to the game you have a lot of people who are really, who are married to the game, but they need somebody to employ them. They need somebody mm. to basically say, Hey, we're bringing you back. Like here's a, we're extending an olive branch. We're bringing you back to the industry because people are depressed at home right now who have known nothing but hospitality for decades. Um, but maybe their skill set is, is so specialized and so niche that they, they just feel stuck. And, and that's a motivator for me as well as to, to build back better a hospitality industry that um, can can re-welcome some of the old timers who have nothing but love to offer to this industry and to our guests, and then make it a space where young people want to actually join the hospitality industry because I'm looking at articles and they're saying like, the I keep referencing back to this food and wine article that came out where it said the customer is not always right look it mm-hmm. up if you haven't, if, if you haven't mm-hmm. read it already, but they were said something about how customer expectations encroach on your humanity as an, as an employee. And I thought that was the biggest load of shit I've ever read in my <laughs> life because I'm like, I'm like, this is what a young person is reading if they're in college or they're coming out and they're like, Oh, hotels are cool. And then you read that article and then 
the way they describe gas, they're talking about how it's dangerous and all this stuff. And I'm like, you know what, this is just irresponsible, immoral to have this kind of um, rhetoric out there for young people who could very well find a lifelong love for this. But it's almost like you're setting them up for failure right off the bat by putting stuff out there like this. Um, so hope, hopefully the efforts of people like us and others who are, um, you know, here and who are coming out can help to make it better for everybody who's in this industry and, and, and everything. Cause we still have a lot of work to do. We do. And, and just leading by example, like doing what you're doing and doing what I'm doing and having like others like Chris, I, when met, meeting her on clubhouse, I was like, Holy crap, like keep going, be an example, be an inspiration. And I, I, there's, I had a moment where I got to go to my high school and, and give a, a, a kind of like a, a talk or a speech to the assembly. And my, my whole point was, if you don't know what you're going to do after high school, you don't know what college, you don't know if you're going to do a, a community college or a, a big university, if you don't have a career path that you know what you're going to jump into, go work at a hotel. You know why? You'll find something you might love, whether that's operations, accounting security there's so many different departments in there get your feet wet figure it out and if you don't like anything that's fine because you can take some time like the young people this is what gets me fired up kyle uh is the the young people like just (sighs) i remember being so lost until i got into hotels when i got into hotels there were so many opportunities at my feet that I knew that there was no, like, there's no going back and whether that's in hotels, but just seeing that the different avenues that you can go outside, but hotels offer such a unique place to start. So I, that's, yeah, it gets me amped up. Like I'm, I'm going to start stuttering over my words here. So I'll leave it at that. But yeah, I'm going to need a sweater or a blanket or something because I am chilly. You are giving me chills, man, with what you're saying. Cause it's, it's, you know, you say I was lost before I found hotels. We all were, man. We all were, you know, it's, it's, you can find a purpose. You can find a family, you can find a home within, within this industry. And it's, uh, it'd be a shame if others weren't able to do the same thing because of the uh, apathy from the current establishment in the industry or or any of those other factors. So um, thank you for your contributions to hospitality. Um, Thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for doing your podcast and and just being an advocate. Um, It's appreciated. And I hope for those listening, I will not be upset if you guys go and check out Will's podcast. That's what we want. High tides raise all ships. So Will, where can, where can our listeners find you? Where can they, they see more from you and where can they uh, convince their parents or their grandparents to rent out their, their spare bedrooms and their spare uh, condos and have you run them for them? Yeah, no, uh, thanks for the uh, opportunity to do a shameless plug, Kyle. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast is the name of the show. We also have Good Morning Hospitality. You can find um, the main podcast and all this stuff on the one website, which is slicktalkthepodcast.com. And for the recreation rentals, um, we have recreationrentals.com. Uh, the website is not currently launched. We're still um, building it and making uh, lots of changes and branding it and, you know, all the startup stuff. So you can uh, find, just message me on anything on, on Slick Talk's website. And then uh, for Kyle and I actually, um, we're going to be on the tourism Renaissance event coming up in March. So uh, definitely check out more there as we get to uh, again, speak to the industry worldwide. Yeah, that's should be uh super super fun and uh we'll we'll talk more about that off the record but anyway guys you've been listening to hospitality md you've been listening to the joe rogan of hospitality not me it's not me it is will slickers i'm sorry i keep saying that man i literally like i'm eating that shit up i love it so much i'm like i wish i would have thought about that like that is clever so i never thought about it yes Go ahead. I, it wasn't me that called it. It was uh, Stuart Butler from Fuel Hotel Marketing. He said it uh, on his podcast. When I heard him say it, I literally like almost shit myself. So <laughs> I just been, I've been running with it. <laughs>
I likewise, I've been shitting myself every time I remind myself that 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 even exists. So yeah, definitely. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, more to come on this. Adam Knight uh, will also be a guest on our show. So uh, like tune in for that one. We'll, we'll have that coming up soon. So thank you again. What's up, guys? Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's interview and for sticking around to the end. Be sure to go down below and find all of Will's social media and podcast episodes for you all to enjoy. We all build together when we help each other grow. With that being said, you can learn more about Hospitality MD in our website, which is in the description. Be sure to follow us on our socials so you don't miss a beat. We will see you next week with more hospitality content right here on Hospitality MD and right here on YouTube.